Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to this webinar series. This is the first webinar of a webinar series we are calling Expanding Community Conservation Across Africa. My name is Ellen Mdima, and I'm from Malyasili. Now, before we get started, I would love to know who I'm speaking with. And so please, um, in the chat, just write your name, the organization you're with, and where you are tuning from. So we'll spend a few minutes doing that as we slowly get started. Now, at Malia Sili, we have over 40 partners across 12 countries in Africa. And because of this, we happen to work with extraordinary organizations that have work that is beyond anything we could ever imagine, tailored to the landscapes that they work with. But unfortunately, they're not well known. So we've decided to create an opportunity and a platform that will be able to share with the broader audience about their work and how they go about things. Today, we're gonna to be starting at my home country, Tanzania. But we'll also be looking at Uganda, Mozambique, Southern Africa, as well as the Kaza landscapes. We're gonna be starting with Honey Guide, a Malia Sili partner that has been with us since 2016. Their mission is very simple, to make community-based conserva conservation deliver in Northern Tanzania. And with us today, we have Damien Bell, who's the executive director of Honey Guide, as well as Sam Shaba, the program manager at Honey Guide. Now, personally for me, I've been super lucky because I have actually managed to work closely with Honey Guide over the last year. They held a Youth for Nature conference in, um, where was it, Damien? Uh, it was somewhere around in Kisongo area, and it had over 150 people who were majority young people. And they managed to get these people in just like two months, which is a typical honey guide style sort of thing. And they really pioneered how to get the youth excited and inspired about the conservation space, which is something that we don't see quite common here in Tanzania and in other areas as well. So this really first, um, I really just got lucky because it was firsthand experience of how Honey Guide works, the lovely team that they are, and actually what a dynamic duo these guys are today. Now, I did try to find the best way to introduce these people, but I didn't find a really nice way. So I asked Damien to tell me one fun fact about Sam. And he said, did you know that when Sam was in the UK, he thought a tofu sandwich would come as wild meat. So he thought tofu was something like wild meat that is made, like is found in the UK. He was kind of shocked to figure out what tofu was. <laughs> By the way, this is one of the many examples that Damien gave me. <laughs> but then Sam, on the other hand, just responded, was like, this is really tough. Can you give me time to think? I can't like answer the question and think at the same time. And it's just the, the spectrum at which these personalities are at and how well they work in tandem just always seems to amaze me. But enough said, Damien and Sam, welcome. Thank you very much and really great to be here. It's um, it's really nice to, to have this opportunity to talk about what we do and what we're so passionate about. And I'm really glad you all joined us today. Um, my name is Sam Shaba, like how Ellen has gracefully introduced us. Um, and today I will tell you more about Tani Guide and what we are and what we do. But before I go into that, I really want to tell you a sad story that started off as a very difficult start. The story is about an area in Northern Tanzania called Randlin Wildlife Management Area, which is outside Tarangire National Park. Uh, for those who don't know what Tarangire is, it's a, one of the very famous uh, tourism circuit in Tanzania, one national park. Now, Randolin is a wildlife management area. In other country, they are known as community conservancies. And they are essentially a model started by the government as a way to make sure that communities benefit from conservation. Now, Randolin was started in 2015. It was started with eight communities, we call them villages in Tanzania, that borders Tarangire National Park. And these 20,000 people, just about, 
decided that they were going to set aside their land for conservation. They have 24 ranges. And when we initially started working Randlin in 2015, we started with a protection approach with a little anti-poaching unit. It didn't take long before the politics in Randlin, initially from the Keto barons who were using Randlin before it was protected, they managed to mobilize enough support and rally the community, the very same community, to protest against Randlin. Now, because of that, this community threatened to beat up the rangers and ban the vehicle that we gave them for protection. And rangers had to flee. Mm -hmm. It took us six months to re-strategize, design a new approach. The community from the same uh, area have heard about the other programs we were doing in the neighboring areas. And they approached us, they actually approached us to say, we need help with the human wildlife conflicts that they were having, initially by elephant raid raiding their farms. So after six months, we went back with a new approach, with human wildlife conflicts mitigation program as our entry point, and with programs that were going to gain trust of the communities alongside all the other things that we wanted to introduce in conservation. The story of Randlin has really influenced what Hanigai is today and the journey we've experienced for the last five years. Honeygate was established in 2007. We've been there for a little over 15 years. We have over 60 staff working in Tanzania, all Tanzanians. And what we're trying to achieve, our main investments at Honeyguide are to community governance and management. We want to make sure that we have strong local governance and management of these local inst institutions. So they thrive as social enterprises. We see these as business for the people, not projects. So today we have 21 wildlife management areas in Tanzania. 20 years ago, the government piloted 16 areas and then with the success and the challenges of those 16 areas, a few more were, were formed. Majority of these wildlife management areas are not working. The concept when they were started was that communities were going to benefit from conservation and in turn, they would want to protect wildlife. Now, the idea was beautiful and it was okay, but to large extent, the WMAs failed. There are very few successful examples of wildlife management areas in mm -hmm. Tanzania today. And when a wildlife management area is formed, usually they have a governance structure with uh, elected members from each of the member villages and some other governance structures. And those were expected to be the main runners and managers of this business. One of the reasons the WMA is really struggled is because there were not professional management that was really built into this structure of managing a business such of the wildlife management areas. And this professional management and their capacity and the systems to go with it is very critical to making sure that the wildlife management area can succeed as a business. Now, one of the reasons these businesses have really struggled is the finances. And we all understand how finances are important in any business, particularly on the conservation business. However, for the case of wildlife management areas and conservancies, there was an overemphasis on revenues. And for the wildlife management areas that for some reason didn't successfully attract enough revenues, that was the reason, that has been the reason for their failure. And also the other challenge is that success in the wildlife management area was not clearly defined. In major areas like the ones in the Northern Tanzania like Randolin, success was a result of tourism operators succeeding. And when that didn't happen, the WMAs are considered failing. So we learned 
that success in our life management area has to have enough focus on social impact as well as ecological impact just as important as the financial success that the WMA can attract. Now, when we had unrealistic income generating activities and the approaches had over emphasis on, 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 on revenues and then forgetting the importance of having social returns, the WMAs were considered by many stakeholders, community that owned them, the investors, the government, the NGOs that were initiating these WMAs, that these WMAs were not going to work and they were considered a failure. Now, it is really important to understand the value of financial mechanisms within a WMA. And today, I want to talk to you about the financial mechanisms of a WMA. And it will be impossible to talk about that without looking at protection. When wildlife management areas were formed, like any other conservation areas anywhere in the world, and even more so for conservationists like myself, wildlife managers and ecologists, we see overemphasis on protection. And protection is really expensive. And if not well managed, the cost can escalate well beyond WMA's means and what they can afford. Now, protection in a conservation area, not just wildlife management areas, so think of national parks, think of uh, conservation uh, areas, think of game reserves, it will usually cost over 60% of a protected area operating cost annually, only in protection. In a wildlife management area, that means one unit with just 10 ranges costs $50,000 of wildlife management area operation expenses. And we've seen movements where donors are very quick to jump into building ranger posts. In some wildlife management areas, they have five ranger posts with three gates. That alone can cost a wildlife management area over $200,000 to run annually. And you're not thinking of management or governance or any other costs, only in protection. And so we had to understand protection. We had to understand how it can impact conservation. And to give you a, a, a live example, I will talk to you about an area in Northern Tanzania that we really challenged the methodology of protection, an area called Makame Wildlife Management Area, the largest WMA in Tanzania. It is as large as the state of Montana in the US. In Makame Wildlife Management Area, 40,000 square kilometers, we really sat down and started to understand the, the, the cost, what it would cost to protect Makame. Now, in a normal protected area, the ratios are, when you have a normal protected area, which is open plains, very low risk on, uh, on poaching, usually you'll have uh, 25 square kilometers per ranger. And when that grows to high risk areas, very bushy, you can't see so far, you need one ranger for every 15 square kilometers. In Makame, this translated to, if we chose to have 25 square kilometers per ranger, that meant 150 rangers. And then if we went on a high risk model, we were looking at 250 rangers. Now that's not, too abnormal. The Tarangire National Park, which is not far from Makame, 2,000 uh, 2, square kilometers, they have 100 ranges. So Makame having 150 to 200 ranges won't be too far from the normal. Now, if we chose to have 150 ranges, we were looking at $180 per square kilometers to protect Makame. And if we, we had to choose 250 ranges, we were looking at over two, uh, 300 square kilometers annually. Now, we wanted to keep a Makame approach because it's a community model. We wanted to keep it a really low cost. However, putting it into context and comparing with the other models across the Africa, we looked at how much it would cost to have protection. And usually in any protected area, 
you're looking at having $800 per square kilometers to protect. Makame, I just talked about 150, 180 to 300. And other areas spending $800 per square kilometers. So it wasn't abnormal to have 200 ranges in Makame. However, we've managed to protect Makame with $23 per square kilometers. We've reached this using an approach that will only have 24 ranges. And this approach was looking at having a anti-poaching unit as firemen rather than as policemen to involve the thousand headers who are allowed to graze inside Makame as the CCTV cameras and informers. Those are the ones to do patrol and the anti-poaching unit to just respond when they are called. With this model that's just costing Makame $100,000 uh, $100, every year, we've managed to reduce poaching by 93% in just three years. So you can see how understanding the cost of protection is critical to achieve sustainability of protected area. Because if not well managed, this will really impact the potential of a protected area becoming sustainable. Now, when we talk about sustainability, we are not only looking at the money. Sustainability for us means three pillars. We're trying to achieve social value where the people of that protected area are seeing the value of protecting this area and keeping it in conservation. We are also looking at the ecological viability of the area. If this area is doing well, it needs to also keep the ecology and the ecosystem intact, protect the wildlife beyond the state owned national parks. At the same time, we really want the financials to thrive so that it is not over dependent on donors. We've been lucky for the past few years to have very supportive donors who have allowed us to experiment with these methodologies experiment with very high risk things that we've tried to get this far. And they have enabled us to learn over the past five years. Now, in the past five years, we've learned masses. We've worked in three protected areas in Northern Tanzania, Randolin that I talked about earlier, Makame and Burunge. All the three are protecting the Tarangire National Park because they are all in the Tarangire ecosystem. Collectively, they protect a dispersal area of over 5,000 square kilometers, which is twice the size of the national park itself. We've spent the last five years really learning the secret recipe to make it work. And this distilled down to having strong governance and management. And we've managed to develop the tools, templates, and resources for building strong governance and management systems in our life management areas. At the same time, we've learned what it takes to build strong social support by having the community, by understanding what community wants in return of their investment of land to conservation. What will it take, what the WMA should do and could invest on to make sure that the community really see the value of protecting. In governance, we've used the framework called SAGE, which is a tool developed by IIED in the UK. It is an assessment tool, site level assessment of governance and equity. To date, we've done nine SAGE assessments across Tanzania in wildlife management areas. And what SAGE gives us, it's just an entry point for building strong governance based on the 10 principles of good governance that are internationally known. As a follow-up to SAGE, we've developed over 18 training modules that are customized for wildlife management areas. These training modules are to build capacity of the leadership of the wildlife management areas so they understand their role and what is not their role, and they are capable of holding management accountable 
as well as acting as a bridge of communication between the wildlife management areas and its stakeholders. And currently we are developing even more tools in a framework called Governance in Action, which is a tool to monitor the governance best practices in a wildlife management area. For management, we are using a framework that's led uh, by best business enterprise sustainability tool, which is essentially a business plan. We, most of us know a business plan, which looks at the financials of, a, of protection and operations of a wildlife management areas with a forecast of potentially five years, three to five years of how this entity is going to build their business and break even. Best business enterprise sustainability tool identifies what community wants in return to their investment. It doesn't only end at the finances. And it also helps bring all stakeholders on board to a common goal to support the investments that are required to deliver these wildlife management areas towards their long-term goal, which is sustainability. With management, we've developed a framework called MAT, which includes the business plan as one of the tools within MAT. MAT stands for Management, Assessment, and Tools. We've developed MAT as an approach to guide the capacity building of management systems within a WMA. Within MAT, which is uh, encompassing around 30 tools, that are focusing on long-term vision, tools like BEST and SAGE that has a long-term plans for the wildlife management area, as well as tools that guide the rules and regulations that they have to follow, such as things like financial policies, human resources policies that are rules to guide the management team, as well as the day-to-day -day working tools, such as budgets and work plans, that will really help the management perform their day-to-day -day operations. And using these tools in MAT, as well as SAGE and governance training framework, we've seen some very good successes in the last five years. In Makame, for example, just for the last three to five years, we've seen 980 increase in their revenues. Makame is the first wildlife management areas in Tanzania that has built a successful carbon project. Since we started in working in Makame, they have attracted three new investors that are investing in the business in Makame, either in carbon or hunting. In Randlin, which is also not very far, Randlin has attracted two new investors, even during COVID times, through a photographic tourism business model. In Randlin, over 92% of the people, the members, the communities that own Randlin, the 20,000 people, think that Randlin really respects their needs. They trust the management, they trust the governance, and they feel that they are included in the decision-making of the Randlin, and they value what Randlin brings to their life. The lessons from Makame and Randlin have really influenced our new strategic plan and what Hanegaid wants to achieve and carry forward from the last five years. In the new strategic plan, Hanegaid has developed three guiding principles. First, Hanegaid will only work in a model that puts community at the driving seat. We want to see conservation succeeding not with honey guide managing the protected area on their behalf. We want community to feel that they've made this a success and they can own the successes, the challenges and the failures throughout the process. We are working, we are going to work in the new areas using a partnership model because we believe in working with others who have a common goal of making wildlife management areas successful. And the third very critical to our guiding principles is we will not work in an area unless we are seeing that we can exit and leave successes behind. We believe in an exit strategy because we want these wildlife management areas to be successful beyond our support. 
we want sustainability. So critical to our theory of change, we approach conservation and wildlife management areas as a business. Like any business in the, in the world, we believe that this business to thrive, it needs strong governance and good management. Like any other business, if we have very weak governance where there's a lot of corruptions and the oversight is not strong, it is very, very difficult to attract investor confidence. So when this business have a very strong governance and management, we've seen investors wanting to invest in these areas, in these businesses. When you have investors like Carbon Tanzania, who have 30 year contract with the wildlife management area, lodge owners who have built lodges in these lands, when you have people who want to put their money because they are seeing they are less of a risk because of good governance and management. This ensures that the WMAs, the businesses, have strong financing. It brings the financing, the financing that will help to run these areas. And very critical, the finances that will bring, it will bring social services to the owners of the business, the return on investment for the stakeholders, the shareholders. With the community seeing the value, with the social services that the sustainable financing is bringing, we're starting to see strong political support in these businesses. Everyone from the government level to the community level wanting these businesses to thrive and not to collapse. And they will protect them about, uh, against bad, bad politics. And this is our theory of change. When that happens, these businesses will become socially valued financially independent and ecologically viable. And that's what we want to see happen. And very critical at the heart of this is good governance and professional management. And these are the two pillars that are, we are taking on to our new strategies. When we look at governance, we've managed to develop modules that are looking high level at the principles of good governance and to make sure that the leaders of these community conservation areas really understand the best practices in governance, where we have leaders who understand their role and what is not their role. When we have leaders who understand the sustainability and the three pillars I just talked about, the finance, the social, and the ecological. We've also developed the technical modules that are aimed at building the gap and making the governance team up to speed with some of the technical modules, like how a community elected leader who is not an accountant, but can provide just enough oversight to a CPA accountant that they have decided to employ. Those are some technical modules that we developed and we train and we make sure that the leadership, the governance team, really understand and they can bring just enough oversight. Within management, we've developed tools within a system called MAT, Management Assessment and Tools, which is spread across seven management areas. A management area within MAT could be financial management. How is the WMA managing their finance? Human resource management. How are they managing their infrastructure and assets? Those are some of the seven management areas that we have developed tools for within MAT. We have developed over 30 tools that will guide these processes. To give you an example, BEST, I talked about BEST is one of the 30 tools, but very clearly financial management policies that will guide how they are managing their finances, as well as the budget as a, and the work plan. When a WMA can translate their long-term goal from best to a day-to-day -to -day tool like a business plan, like a budget. Matt splits the, 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 the score of a wildlife management area from stage one when they are barely legal, they don't have the tools, to level three where they have started using these tools and level five when it is culture 
for them to use all professional business management tools. Within our strategy, we have developed a partnership model where we believe that for us to succeed expanding to areas we want to expand, we want to share our experience with like-minded organizations that wants to scale up this model with us, learn from what we have, and implement in the areas that they have been working in their areas. We are also choosing to work with partners and collaborate because we do not want to stretch Hanegai's resources in order to reach all these goals that we're putting. And so we have identified two major goals in our new strategic plan. First is by 2026, we have the knowledge from Makame and Randlin to impact over 15 wildlife management areas, over 2,000 square kilometers, 22,000 square kilometers across Tanzania. To get these WMAs to a level where they are also delivering socially, ecologically, and financially, like Randlin and Makame. And the second goal, we want to change the negativity that is currently among various stakeholders, thinking that community-based conservation is a failure, cannot work, communities can't. And for those who think that they'd rather become state-owned national parks like everything else. So with the success from the first goal, with the partnerships and collaborations, we want to change that narrative and increase political support towards wildlife management areas. In Tanzania, we have identified these 15 areas, the brown ones on the map are wildlife management areas. The 15 wildlife management areas where we want to invest our resources and partner with like-minded organizations to make them successful by 2026. To achieve this, Hanegaid expects to raise $12 million. Out of this $12 million, we believe that we can work with our partners in those landscapes to raise at least $2 million so that Hanegate doesn't have to raise that directly. Within $2 million, within the $10 million, we will invest over 83% back to a wildlife management area. 51% of that will be the capital investments required to make the business work. And when I talk about this, I mean, building roads, building offices, buying laptops, putting internets, salaries for the team that we are going to recruit in order to start up that business as a startup capital. And the remaining 32% as cost for coaching and trainings that I've talked about. So we have raised to date over $8 million already. And we're just looking for extra $2 million to get us to achieve the strategic plan ahead. With this, we really want to welcome you, everyone in this call, stakeholders and partners, to learn with us, to take on all the experience from the past five years of learning that Hanegai have had, to learn from the successes in Randlin and Makame, to scale this up to many more WMAs in Tanzania, conservancies in other parts of Africa and worldwide. We want you to co-create because we've put as open source all the knowledge that we've gathered so that others can benefit from our experiences, our part mistakes and successes. If you want to learn more from Honey Guide, you can subscribe to our newsletter at the footer of our website. And you can also go to hanegate.org slash learn. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. That was great to listen to. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much, Sam. And it's interesting because for me, what I have, the one thing that has stayed in my, my mind right now is Makame is the size of Montana. I don't know why that is still going. It's it's amazing how large these areas are and the things that you're able to do with the budgets that you have, reducing the numbers, but increasing the impact. It's all just beautiful and wonderful and great job. Now, 
There are a couple of questions that are coming up, but I have a few of my own. And one of them is why Honey Guide? Why the name Honey Guide? What does it actually mean? Who to best answer that than the founder? <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, it came back some time ago. I think there is the Honey Guide, the bird. And for some people who have never heard about sort of the Honey Guide, but it does, um, when you're walking out in the bush, you'll be wandering around and you'll start to see this little bird suddenly go, and it kind of bugs you a bit. Yeah. And you will follow that bird. And the idea is the tradition says the bird takes you to the honey. And tradition and then the folklore say that if you do not leave um, some honey behind for the bird, the next time the bird meets you, it'll take you to you to to Aduiyaku in Tanzania, we'd say, which is your danger, maybe the lion. And those are the folklores that come out with it. So really the meaning of Honey Guide is that we are trying to take communities to, to, um, to the resources of their natural resources there to extract out of the natural resources in a sustainable manner. So that's kind of where the, the name comes from. We don't do anything with honey. And that's, that's <laughs> the name. Okay, we've learned that people keep on saying, oh, do you do honey? And we say, nope. <laughs> that's incredible and i have heard the the folklore i just i it's interesting because i hadn't placed it in the way that you've placed it that's a very special name um you have talked a couple of times around co-creation and so i think i understand what it is in theory but what does that look like in practice that's a good question, isn't it, Sam? What yeah. does that look like? Good question for yeah. all of us. Yeah. Okay. So I'll start by giving you an example, Ellen. So we have 30 management tools, tools mm -hmm. that almost any business is using. A business right. plan, a work plan, a budget, a financial policy. Okay. Now, these tools, although they have been customized for wildlife management areas, they could easily be used to help a conservancy, easily be used to help a business startup. So we want to put it out there. When we say co-creation, we mean us uploading the materials we have to a public place where anyone can click a link and find, where they can download this Excel spreadsheet template of a budget, and they can just put their logo and name up there and put their expenses and they call it their web plan. When we say co-creation, we mean when someone like that decides that there is an additional column that will really help, and they decide that they've added that column, they can feed back to us and say, honey guide, can you improve that budget template that you have with this new fancy column? That will help that tool even better. And that means it will even influence what we knew and make our tools even better. When I say co-creation, I mean uh, an organization like STEP, which we partner with in Roa Ecosystem, Central Tanzania, who have been working in a wildlife management area in protection only, but now are interested to do more by building capacity of management and governance. So they can use some of our experts to train the WMA that they've been supporting for years. They can use some of the tools that were developed to make that the WMA successful as Randlin and Makame. That's what mm. I mean with co-creation. And I think another thing, you know, when we first set out, a lot of our times we'd say, okay, we've got to do a human resource policy. And we'd scramble out and try and find something online. And we couldn't, so we'd have to develop it ourselves. And same with finance and admin policy. And these are very customized for WMA. It's very customized for community conservation areas. And so in a way, I, we kind of say, well, we don't need others to go through the same struggle. If we've got this stuff already, let's put it out there. Let's have people to be able to take this, look at it. And we're no experts here either. So I really hope that we get some experts out there who can say, hey, we can add this. We can make this better. Let's make them better. Um, the more we have people sharing, making these tools better, the more they can be useful for a much broader uh, scope across Africa of um, community-based conservation. I love it. 
Um, so we had a question by a participant and the question is conservation organizations are often afraid to fail, but you seem to have a good appetite for risk and trialing new methods. What advice do you have for similar organizations? This is a great question. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think um, to have an appetite for risk, I think, is the first thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, and make sure your donors are aware that I think being honest with your donors, uh, um, with the people who are going to be funding this, that this is a risk. Um, and the other, because we're not going to succeed in community based conservation if we don't take risks. This right. is such a dynamic field we're working in. Um, we don't, it's not like we have something that's been tried and tested for the last 30 years and hey, we, all we have to do is cut and paste and go. I think those are the things. I think, um, Sam, have you got? Yeah. So I think just learning from our experience here, yeah, um, I'll add a few other things as advice to organizations like Honey Guide. First, yeah, appetite to risk, yes. Uh, use that as an opportunity to learn. Many organizations are uh, avoiding going into some models or some initiatives that no one has done before because they are afraid of the risk, but also that ruins their opportunity to make mistakes and learn, which Hanegate has been so good at making mistakes and learn. Uh, second is when you just have just enough things to try, do not run and go into many implementations. Focus on very small pilot. Uh, in case of Honeyguide, we just focused on two areas for the last five years. Refine your model, make mistakes in a very small scale, and then you're ready to scale up. We're, and don't, I think the, the, the advice there, the last advice is just have enough balance. Don't wait for too long for you to scale up. 80% uh, is good enough for perfectionists out there. And also do not rush into, hey, I'm going to change the world. I'll tackle all conservation areas in the world. Just mm -hmm. focus on a very small pilot of whatever you're trying to do. And when you're just ready, scale up. Right. And between um, you two, who's the perfectionist over there? That, that felt like a personal jab over there. Who's the perfectionist? Who's the one who's like, oh, let's wait. <laughs> Uh, it's, uh, I'm not blaming everyone else and forget myself. <laughs> Just that I have enough balance structure <laughs> around me to say, hey, 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 leave that alone. <laughs> yes, there are people like me out there. And I think yeah. it is looking at also calculated risk. It's not irresponsible risk. You know, you got to, you know, it's going to keep you awake at night, but it is calculated risk. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I agree. Um, also asked by somebody in the question, in the Q&A section, you are working with three WMAs, but you have mentioned only two as a successful model. Mm -hmm. What is your experience with the third one? Uh, Burunga is one of the pioneer, is Burunga one of the pioneers of WMA in Tanzania? Um, Burunga, and I think, I would say that probably the, the one place we have learned a lot of um, and I've had some real wow moments is Burungi. Um, and Burungi, I think it was one of the highest grossing WMAs um, in Tanzania, lots of money. And um, you've got a lot of uh, challenges when there's money coming in, uh, okay. when it starts off on um, a footing that hasn't got good roots. Um, the communities have really struggled to come around and work out what they need. And it's taken a while for them to understand the value of socially social value rather than financial. Um, our energy, our passion, and our belief that Burungi will work has not stopped. Um, right. And I think that's the other thing about community-based conservation is it's not an overnight process. I mean, we, you never stop. Keep going. Keep have, Keep faith in that model. There are people there who want to make it work. Um, mm -hmm. and it's got to all learn together. I hope that answers that question as I tread <laughs> carefully. <laughs> no, no, no. And I think you've done really well because I think we we do we do present the success stories. And I love the fact that you've presented all the stories, right? It's not 
I think that learning, and I love that you switched that. And it's like, it's not necessarily failing. It's like a learning lesson. And you still have hope that at some point it is going to get to the other place where the other ones are. And it's all just part of the story. And it's, it's that all part of that trust with the donors and honesty of like, look, A, B has worked. C, tunendele. <laughs> I said try, yes. <laughs> I think if you are serious about community driven conservation, you mm -hmm. have to realize that it's not an overnight deal. That some right. models take rather quickly, other times communities can take time, and you've got to be patient. Yeah, and also to add just one tiny thing in community conservation, for example, the wildlife management areas, you have many more stakeholders who want something from it. I think very different from a private ranch, yeah. obviously very different from a state-owned national park. Right. In a community conservation model like wildlife management areas, you have the community themselves, you have the local district, you have the government, you have the national parks that's bordering the, this community, you have uh, investors, there are various investors, you have donors. So there are many stakeholders and NGOs like Honey Guide, and that really, challenges the successes and failures of, of, of this area. And for Burundi, I think that was a major challenge. These, these right. varying pull of power from stakeholders, and in many cases, even beyond communities themselves. Mm. Can I add one thing there? And I really feel that tools that we talked about, the SAGE, the site assessment tool, the business enterprise sustainability tool, those actually enable um, all these different factors to understand where it's going. And unfortunately, Burungi didn't have that in place. Mm. And what, I do believe once you have something in place, everyone can relax a bit and feel, oh, this is where we're going. Right. Okay. Well, that's important. Reminded me of like the whole, uh, when there's a lot of people, there's a lot of things. Mm. And so <laughs> I can imagine that played a part. Um, <laughs> I don't know how to put that in English. Uh, she <laughs> cooked all the broth. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was, I, David, I'm glad. I was struggling for a second there as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you provide some examples of the benefits communities have requested and received? Yeah, okay. I will not mention the financial benefit to start with. Mm -hmm. yeah, that has been the least in mm -hmm. the in many places we've we've been. So in Randlin, the benefit that they value the most is the fact that they treat that area, three hundred and twelve square kilometers, as a grass bank. Right. It Can is you explain the, what a grass bank is for some of us? It is an insurance scheme for the 20,000 people who are majorly pastoralists, that when drought comes, mm. their only revenue activities, which is livestock keeping, will be secure because they will have grass that's been saved very well and managed in Randolin. They can just plug in the ATM and access <laughs> the resource. Okay? So the green top ATM. Most benefit, <laughs> The value that they put into the grass and the second most benefit, which is the service of pro crop protection that Randolin brings, mm -hmm. those two values made sure that community still wanted Randolin to continue during COVID when Randolin was making zero revenues. The communities decided, they approached management and said, hey, you can spend our money when it comes. You don't have to give us that cut that you usually give us because you, we want you to keep the little that you've got to protect Randlin because we really love Randlin. It is really valuable to us. So mm -hmm. grass, uh, these social services and for Randlin case, it's the human wildlife conflict mitigation. Yeah. In other areas like Makame, the community there are seeing Makame as some structure that's protecting their land, which was threatened, pre Makame, the land in that area was threatened by big uh, farms, farming encroachments. So people from Dodoma, further south of Makame, 
opening big farms from the forest in Makame. So their movement to say start a WMA was because we, that we know a wildlife management area is going to protect our land. So it's not transformed to agriculture. If Makame was not making any money, the community, and I believe that strongly, the community there will still want Makame to continue just to protect the land, okay? Mm -hmm. And we are seeing other areas, we're experimenting with uh, a wildlife management area providing social services, a wildlife management area improving health, uh, improving education, which are one of the things that communities in Tanzania really value when you have like good education for your children and you have good health for, for the pregnant women and the elderly. So we're experimenting with these other benefits that the wildlife management area can bring and remove that overemphasis in, 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 in money. Mm, right. People do not want money. They want something that money can do. And I think that's why it's also equally important to focus on governance because it doesn't matter. You bring in money, but there's poor governance. That money is yeah. not going to achieve anything. It's not going to deliver anything. Mm -hmm. uh, so equally, you need to have good governance structures in there in order to make sure that the, the funding that's going in, into these projects is actually delivering. Right. Uh, and so I it's think, really just a tool like anything else if it's, yeah. used, it's right or wrong. And, I, I, and I'll give one other thing, on, on emphasis on those first two points that Sam mentioned was that the, 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 the grass bank, the grazing, and the human wildlife conflict, these are direct household benefits. Every household has cattle, so they value that benefit. Where, and we're always looking for direct household benefits in the world of conservation. And so these are very direct household benefits yeah. compared to building the village office, for example. Yeah. yeah. And to uh, I will just add something small. Um, when we started running, I gave you a story at the very beginning. Uh, we were chased away. Um, they scared to ban the car. Um, it took three, four, it took four years for a PhD student who came and spent two years in Randolin. And he came to prove a theory that uh, why do community hate uh, conservation so much? So he came with that theory, yeah? And asked a few people, asked many people, spent two years, this guy, um, asked many people, why do you hate Randolin? Why, 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 what happened? And then, we, he was surprised that not only people did not hate Randlin after five years of trying, 92% said we wanted to stay. Mm -hmm. Very few said, yeah, 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 we surely hate it. Uh, you know, it just took our land. It's just an extension of Tarangira National Park. Uh, that land, yeah, it's just that management team, those leaders who are trying to sell that land to Damien. So... <laughs> Very few people have said that. We have those, but over 90%. We are all surprised. When we started, the metric was if we get over 50% just saying they value it, we have succeeded because we are coming from a baseline where everyone hated it. Right. But nine, over 90%. For what? For, for the grass, for the yeah. trust, for the ownership, for being on the driving seat and knowing that it is theirs. It comes mm -hmm. with all the challenges. It comes with all the successes, but it is theirs. It's not Hannigan's, it's not um, yeah. WWF's, it's not anyone's, it's not government's, it is theirs. Right, yeah. That's interesting. I think we touched a little bit back on like the whole perfectionism of like 50% was good, a win is a win, and then people would go up and it'd get better, right? That's yeah. absolutely fantastic. So now, um, how many how have you avoided falling into the what the conservation trap of trying to do everything because there are there are how many wmas in tanzania but you focused in one two or three. At different levels yeah. <laughs> of trying to so like yeah like yeah. many other organizations are trying to do things in, in places where they work and they're just doing everything how have you managed not to do that hmm. um I think when we first set out, it was um, being realistic as to what we could achieve. Um, mm. One of the things was that I had actually prior to working uh, prior to working with WMAs, um, and when Honey Guide was really searching its roots as to who it was, what it wanted to do, um, Honey Guide 
was actually working in Zanzibar as well as oh. elsewhere. And what we found was that the travel time, the distance, we couldn't move fast enough, learn fast enough. So actually what we it kind of, when we decided, okay, let's do our strategic plan. One of the things was let's make sure that the areas that we're working are within reach, mm. that we can build a relationship, that we don't see people once a month or something, that we're seeing people regularly. I think that's one thing is that it had to be within reach, the, the areas. The other one was that uh, one of the things we always do is we do a financial forecast. We assess the area first and see, is it going to be potentially possible to become financially sustainable? Because we do not want to build false expectations with communities to say, yes, you'll, we'll develop you guys, but then in the end, we're going to have to leave because that's what we promised to do. But we want to be able to leave when they are able to fund themselves and not collapse. So I think it was looking at what's financially, what can become financially um, sustainable and what's within our reach that we can create relationships and really learn quite frequently, regularly visit these areas. And therefore it's the choice of those three that within our reach in our learning stage of, of Honey Guy. Right. Um, is that saying that says much, uh, like much what you can chew or something, something around those lines? I know what you're saying, but for some weird reason, it's also escaped me. When something is this big, but you're like this small. I know someone knows it in the audience. So <laughs> we only take what we can chew. Don't, uh, we only bite what we can chew. Is that right? There's yeah. also that. <laughs> <laughs> I totally understand what oh, you're yeah. saying. I just did not have the words. Right. Uh, I have. So... More than that, that he usually bites a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> like that quote. <laughs> yeah. So, Even the tofu. Only... You remember the tofu experience? Well, that probably taught him a bit. <laughs> we only have two minutes left, and I do want to have like a minute extra just to like wrap things up. So, I want to ask two like fast questions. Um, first, what advice would you give to others who are looking to expand community conservation and where they work? And maybe like two sentences. <laughs> um, if you want to expand and work out um, in new areas and um, map out, create, uh, well, first of all, do a strategic plan. Let me just give you that one advice, do a strategic plan. I I remember when Malia Silly came to me with, you know, let's do your Damien Union strategic plan, I resisted. And I'll I heard admit, about this. <laughs> uh, I was wrong. <laughs> right. That's number one. Just do a plan because it really helps you figure everything out. We're going to stick with that one plan because that's the first step anyone needs to take. And it's such a big step on its own. And what motivates you both every single day? What drives you? And I want one word from each of you the challenge. The challenge. Challenge, one word. Oh, yeah, he said two. He cheated, Damien. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can scribble. You can scribble. Uh, challenges and the unexpected. The unexpected challenges and expected, guys. Sam and Damien, thank you so much for your time. This has been so much. I've learned so much, but we have almost come to the hour and I truly enjoyed this. And I wonder if anyone else enjoyed this as much. I mean, I can see the reactions coming up, which is fantastic. Please do stay aware of our next webinar series. We will be posting it on social media. You can follow us. You can get links to the newsletter. We'll probably have summaries of this, but it has been wonderful being with all of you today and thank you for still staying on until the hour before you leave i know it is seven here um so it might be other different times before you leave i also want to hear from you one sentence what have you learned today one thing that has really impacted you today before as you leave uh thank you so much damien and sam and we should probably Helen. catch up thank you, Malia, uh, thank you <laughs> and talk a little bit more about uh honey guide thank you so much Asante sana. Thanks, Asante. Ellen, for the